Probably that's what he's saying. So if, if so, if your LEQ, if you were saying you were going to set that at 35, 40, 45, whatever, and you set it at L90 instead, I would assume it's going to be lower than 35. Well, we're going to go through his whole letter and try to sort these things out and have an explanation of it next week because that's the first time we have a chance to talk about it. But I mean, you could go through it, it basically, Paul, and you know this because you didn't you have a degree in computer science or something at one point? Computer science? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Well, it was something technical, you know, that involved a lot of, of, of numbers. It's a statistical thing. You know, every one of these statistical variables has some sort of, of influence by something. You know, there's always some source of error in any statistical sampling. You can go no, through... No, I'm not talking about error at all. I'm talking about when you measure the sound that's coming from a wind turbine and you set the limit at 35 LEQ, there will be sound higher than 35 decibels measured on the A scale at least I believe, I, I'm not sure if LEQ is median or mean, but there will be half the time the sound will be louder than that. Not half not, the time. Not true. Okay. But when, put a sound meter, when I put a sound meter on an employee at work, okay, for an eight hour period, all right, there could be, they, they could be exposed to, you know, 80 decibels, 83 decibels for most of the day. But then if for like one, minute or whatever, okay, they get exposed to like 101 decibels, it's going to increase that, that, that right. L level up. Now it's possible, depending on for how many minutes compared to the other, that it would go up higher. However, you're not talking about, uh, with your, right. we're talking about a, a wind turbine, you're not talking about like an engine, like a chainsaw or a, a, a pair of um, aerospace, ground, aerospace ground equipment or a jet engine where there's you know some element of acceleration and thrust involved you know in other words an increase in fuel because the wind doesn't increase at the same rate of increase that the, that the or the, the turbine the fuel being the wind the wind does not increase in supply at the same rate as the fuel air mixture going into an engine okay and that's why you get these wild exaggerations yes Paul I'll listen okay so that's why you get these wild exaggerations in in, in the statistics However, with a wind turbine, you're talking about the wind is going to blow, it's going to go below 25, and then it might gust up to 35. But then even if it gusts up to 35, you know there's breaks in the turbine so, because they don't want the turbine to suddenly thrust from 25 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour because if it does that, there's a possibility it's going to have some sort of cyclic stress involved with it that's going to cause it to fail. So clearly, there's a braking system in there so that it gradually increases. So by the time it gets up even to the higher rate of speed, okay, it's not going to go too fast because if it goes too fast, it'll break. It's going to actually stop at a certain point and cycle back down. At that point, because it's cycling down, it's going to cycle down at a lower rate of speed because the rate, the noise that you hear from a wind turbine in a cell is all based on the rotational factor of those gears in there. That's where that sound is coming from and a little bit of the swish of the actual blade cutting the air. I mean, this is not rocket science. So I, I misspoke that L50 is not the same as LEQ. I realize that. Okay? But LEQ is somewhere between L90 and L10. Is that correct? Yes. Okay? And so somewhere between LEQ and L10, the sound is going to be louder than it is at LEQ. It's possible for an instant it could go up louder, but it can't go up at an appreciable speed because the, the rate of change of sound increase is going to be proportional to the rate of change of prop speed. And the prop speed can't increase fast enough to give you a rate of change that's probably discernible to your ear for the time period that you'd actually need to hear it. It's not like it doesn't go fast enough. It's their acceleration constant in there. But not even something of a constant, it's a variable acceleration. So if, you, if you're going to change to L90, what's the advantage of that? Because Dave Hessler is an expert, okay, and he's hired by many consulting agencies. He has a lot of experience, more than us, so we're going to consider, not take for sure, we're going to consider 
that number. But like we discussed like several times now, we haven't had a chance to have a group discussion on it because we haven't had a meeting to talk about it. And we're more than open to listen to discussion about it, you know, and we're going to take what you said. You, you're so basically the, the summary of what we're hearing from you, in my opinion here, is that if it's not L-E-Q and we use L-90, you believe that the sound threshold should be lower than 40 or 35 equivalent of L-E-Q. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's from my amateur uh, understanding of the difference between L-90 and L-E-Q. So just as just we're not going to use these numbers, but just academically, just pretend if we said L90, if we said LEQ of 35, you would think that L90 would be 33, for example, or something. Not those exact numbers, but that's the concept. And your question is? So the question would be if we had currently said LEQ of 35 as just a simple example, not using these numbers, just to have an academic discussion here, you would think that the L90, in your opinion, should be like 33. No, I'm saying, how do you come up with it? What, how would you, as the board, what would, what would be your thought process? What would you be c considering on how, how to change it from 35 to what? What if you pick a number out of the year? Is well, there well, probably some... this week, I would recommend, I'm going to have to talk to, crap, I, I see your hand up there. This week, I'm, and I'm going to call on Teresa. This week, what I would recommend to the board and Bruce and I, myself too, is to go read about L90 and LEQ and make sure we understand clearly what L90 and LEQ mean so that next week we can have an intelligent discussion about it. That's what I recommend. Threads. It appears to me that at some point the wind turbines reach a maximum rotation and that more than likely the sound will be the loudest at those times. So at maximum wind turbine rotation, what sound levels have been recorded? What can we expect? Because if the wind blows at 25 miles an hour most of the night or dusts up to 60 for a long period of time, they may be sustained for those levels. And Paul's point, I think, is that when they do reach maximum speeds, what are those sound levels and what can people expect? Well, so. what we had done for the previous project is there was an ISO contour drawing done for the worst case condition in every direction, 360 degrees, with the presumption of what the highest winds could be up on that hilltop based on the meteorological tower that's been up there for a couple of years now. Um, at that time, it's been up there for, I think, 18 months before the, the actual analysis was accomplished and the drawing was presented. So they had 18 months worth of meteorological data. So they, could, they had a, a, uh, a, a rational set that they could measure where they could count on to get the most likely high wind speeds, okay? Then they took those numbers, they took the, the wind turbine motors and prop diameters, et cetera, and did a calculation based on how fast those things could the wind at the worst case condition at 360 degrees would be able to rotate those, whatever those maximum speeds were. I couldn't tell you what those max speeds were off the top of my head. Then they had to do drawings based on the uh, calculated sound output as in the cell, so that being the sensor or, or, the, or the emitter, and then that sound waves, those sound waves went out and they drew, them at, I think, one decibel contours out from the cell, I think, to, what, 6,000 feet or something? I forget, it was quite a ways. Oh, it's, it's over a mile. It's like a mile and a half. I think. I thought we did, but I, I don't remember the exact number, but basically in the, in the record there's a drawing for that particular project that goes out like a mile and a half showing what the estimated sound contours would be based on the worst case condition from 360 degrees. How do they compare to that 35 figure they're talking about? You're, you're possibly saying. Well, by those drawings in front of me, I mean, I believe that that, that is hitting like roughly 30. Um, as well, it's like well inside 4,000 feet, it hits those 35s. I mean, at almost every residence, other than actually, I think mm -hmm. even at the two residences that are inside, uh, that are just outside of 4,000 feet, that would be the one that Bruce Cummins used to live at, and uh, Oliver, I believe. Other than that, everyone else is out at about a mile, and if you look at those charts, it's at 30 dBA or less. And that is the maximum power level. That's not public hearing. That's last 
And there are probably going to be peaks occasionally that might exceed that slightly. But again, you're all the way down to 30 dBA. Yeah. They measured uh, for compliance at the original assembly. And at uh, the same the full sound power. And if they're rotating. Oh, yeah, you can the slides. They're on the slides. Because go to the next slide. Go to the very last slide. Uh, I will say this too. I've been to Beaver Ridge, not Beaver Ridge, to Bull Hill now twice. Uh, go to uh, yeah, that Freedom twice, Bull Hill twice, and Myers Hill twice. And I'm not sure how many people right. here right. who are concerned have actually been and visited any of these. Bull Hill is relatively close. So I just right. took readings there uh, only a week ago during uh, some fairly high wind conditions. So what I can do is bring in those readings next week because I've got them recorded. I can, I can actually put them here on the screen, what the actual readings were. But the other thing I would say to anyone here, and actually I've asked Carol, except she wasn't available yet, to go over, and I'll take anyone over to Bull Hill. And I think you really need to hear them yourself, especially when you get out at several thousand feet. Because by the time I was up to 4,000 feet, I could not pick out the wind turbines from the background noise. And you don't, outdoors, when the wind is blowing, get background noises of 30 dB or 35. I was getting background noises of 42, 45. Once the wind is blowing at any speed at all, and I was in a sheltered spot down inside of some trees, but there's no leaves, in the summertime with leaves, it'll be worse. It'll be much higher ambient sound. Uh, like I say, I couldn't pick the wind turbines out. This, this is a chart, and, and sorry, sorry I, I did, actually, I'll tell you right now that I told Paul, I know that you guys who do this work are smart guys, and you guys charge quite a bit of money to have conversations about this stuff, but when I took a scale and laid it on the paper, you know, for the, the decibels, it really wasn't substantially different in a vacuum than the big calculations do. We don't charge that much. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, if you look at these numbers, though, you know, this is, if you ever want to know this, like, roughly, you know, from sound power, this is, this is the standard physics book equation for what sound power you get from an emission. And, you know, I pulled this off of uh, a, a, another, um, another engineer's work. Uh, in one of the uh, things from the Massachusetts, uh, there's a task force down in Massachusetts, you know, with the Massachusetts DEP working on wind, and it's on the website too. Uh, but at any rate, this chart came from there. And what it is, is it shows you roughly that if you were at 105 decibels, which I believe this one was supposed to be like 103 or 102, it's between 100 and 105 for the one that was, you know, this Pisgah project. But if you come down the list to see it, like, you know, at 3,000 feet, it's already down, you know, between 29.5 and 34.5, so if you just split it, because that's where this particular one is, you know, you're down below 35 decibels, you know, at 3,000 feet. You come out to 4,000 feet, you know, you're down, you know, in the 30-ish decibel range. You know, so you're well within, within tolerance. This has nothing, this is like in, in, in free air, you know, with no attenuation for leaves or ground or, or, or anything else. And this is DBA, not DB, it's DBA. And this, this is, like I said, anybody can go get this out of a physics book and do it. And this isn't, this isn't like some consultant just trying to tell you something. You can go look it up in your high school science book. And I just, I don't know what else to say. What you could say is that it's dissipation due to distance only and it doesn't reflect additional dissipation due to atmospheric absorption. Right. It's just raw distance. Could you also say that it doesn't account for topography, such as, you know, reflections, whether it's the geology of the, the granite that they carry vibrations or a mountain that's going to bounce sound waves uh, in unique directions? Uh, you, could, you could say that, but that's why sophisticated models take that into account. And that's why our model took that into account. Right, his model does take that into account. But I, I guess what I'm just trying to point out is when you, if you just, you know, on your own, if some, somebody says something is generating this much sound, and you just took your ruler out and put it on a piece of paper because you just wanted to know what it would look like, you, anybody at home could take that formula and put it into your calculator, put it into your Excel spreadsheet, you know, and roughly estimate what it's going to be. And, I'll, and you know, barring some 
odd geological formation. It's going to be pretty darn close to what these numbers are. I mean, I just, I mean, that's part from my perspective. I mean, you know, I didn't really spend a lot of time on this. I have to admit that this past several months, I spent a lot more time looking at this down into the weeds, you know, than I did before, you know, even though I had done this like 15 years ago in a different job, you know, at the industrial sound level, not for this sort of thing, you know, because I was never concerned about sounds at 4,000 feet at an industrial environment, you know, but nevertheless, I mean, it's the same principles apply, and it's just kind of interesting, you know, how it all works out, and the fact is, is everybody's questioning how, 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 how these numbers can be right and stuff all the time when you can just get it right out of a physics book. I mean, I just, that's what's frustrating for me. And it's backed up by real-world studies of active operating wind farms at full sound power like they did at Beaver Ridge Wind in December. They measured noise levels with the turbines at full sound power at 3,200 feet of 29 decibels, EBA, and at 2,800 feet, 35 and 36 feet. Uh, you go to the next slide. So some people like a graphical version. There's a graphical version of it. So... If you graph it out, there's the there's the lines, and here's 35 decibels. I mean, I mean same same answer. Just obviously, some people look, at, you know, can understand pictures better than they can the numbers. What has happened is that there has been a lot of discussion of people claiming that there are all kinds of negative health effects, and there the has been negative health effects when people are way too close, and if you're also a noise sensitive individual. But even the World Health Organization says 40 dBA outside of bedrooms is acceptable with no known long-term health benefits. There might be a short-term one night or something you have, but they say 40 decibels outside of the bedroom. Right. We're taking a lower standard than that. But, but the standard calls for the greater of 35 dBA or the LEQ. Well, actually, like we're, uh, I'm looking after Hessler's reading, I'm talking about, I will be suggesting we drop that. But the greater of would only apply if the ambient sound at your location was higher. And the point is, we're limiting the, the, the uh, wind turbines at this point at 35 dBA. If the sound outside of your house is 45, you're not going to hear that 35 decibel turbine. Uh, if, if, the, if the wind is at 45 outside of my house, uh, the wind turbines would be... No, they the don't. They don't. No, see, that's where you want. <laughs> the turbines don't get any louder. The sound that I'm they're... I'm talking about the ordinance, not the turbines. Well, the ordinance is based on... Okay, I'm not sure. You're, you're, you're thinking, okay, the sound level outside your house is 45, let's say. Mm -hmm. If the turbines are only putting out 35 at that point, you're not going to hear them. But, but the ordinance allows for 50 under those conditions. But what difference does it make? Yeah, that's well, no, right. it doesn't. It doesn't allow for 50 under those conditions. I, I, I was pretty sure it was the LEQ pre. Well, again, I'm talking about dropping that. But the thing is, what it allows is immaterial if it's not going to happen. Well, I think it's important to write the ordinance. Uh, not for a specific project, but for all potential projects. Well, no, that's what we're doing. But the point is, okay, I, I think I think I'm trying I'm trying to understand what you're saying. But the, the reality of it is, is probably your it's modeled so that it it's actually for a residence at your house. It's mo the ordinance says it can't go over 35. Period. No, I, that's not my understanding. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I hope I am. Is that correct, Bruce? No, because we did say the grade on again. He recommends, Hessler recommends dropping that, and I'm going to recommend dropping that. But again, whether it's allowed or not, it's never going to get that loud. The situation was, what the idea was, if you had high ambient sound around your house, to not force them to have to do crazy measurements around your house because you say, I can hear the wind turbine and it's 60 decibels of, of ambient sound outside your house and you claim the wind turbines are higher than 35. Well, it's sort of ridiculous. It would be, I'm, I'm trying right, to... Right, but in the, in the ordinance though, isn't it modeled though so that the, that the house 
if you're not assuming like when you get when you're doing the modeling up front the upfront modeling is the determining factor so the upfront modeling doesn't assume that there's 45 decibels at the individual's house no. that's only the compliance modeling down the road the compliance modeling down the road that says if we if, if you say that there's because when you do the you, you don't know for a fact what the noise is at the individual's house before you get started no you don't right so that's why it's 35 because it's all the, the the design the product design is based on 35 okay now let's say that you know a year after the project's up you're the the the, the homeowner comes and says i have a problem i hear the wind turbines well then at that point you go down and do a very finite modeling at that person's house and then you find out that normally it's 45 decibels at that person's house okay well then that's a horse of a different color okay because now it's always 45 and when the project was designed it, it could only be 35 so clearly you can't ever be you're not here you, you can't hear it because it's 35 you know it, it can't be more than 35 at the house because it, it can't it can't emit any more sound than that you know the ordinance allows for but you can't, it, it's physically impossible. Well, think of it this way. Your speed limit 